the educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. A lot of parents and even teachers wonder if having their child in Montessori school is really worth it, you know, particularly for the kindergarten and elementary years and maybe even beyond. In other words, does Montessori actually make a difference in a child's life? For me, assuming the Montessori school is a great one, I definitely think the answer is yes. But I wanted to have someone on the show who's actually experienced Montessori firsthand as a child and for many, many years. So today I'll be speaking with William Kelly, who attended Montessori from preschool all the way through junior high. And now, years later, Will is a thriving entrepreneur helping to lead a unique education technology company called Knack. Now, I first came across Will after reading a short interview he gave, and I was impressed. But I'll let you hear from Will yourself, and you can be the judge about this young man, as well as about if Montessori really makes a difference in a child's life or not. So here we go. Welcome, Will. Happy to have you on. Thanks, Jesse. I'm happy to be here. Cool. Uh, so I know we talked briefly, you know, a few weeks ago. You told me that you told me this early memory you had in Montessori. I think it was about an interaction with another child, and it was just really meaningful to me. Uh, do you mind just sharing that as we start off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think what you're referring to um, was when I was three years old, uh, which is when I started at Montessori in Children's House. Uh, my one of my earliest memories is actually being read to by another classmate of mine, uh, and the. The interesting thing about it is that the classmate was younger than me. He was only two years old, um, and he was reading, you know, sort of a full-on, uh, you know, chapter book um, to me and another student. Uh, and I just remember being in that situation and, and being amazed at, um, you know, not only the fact that he could, you know, read at that young age, but yeah. it, you know, it also kind of motivated us to, you know, be more focused on, you know, expanding our abilities in that area. You know, moving from the simple books, you know, reading words like cat and hat, um, you know, moving into a more narrative style format. It was, uh, it was a pretty cool experience, especially reflecting back on it now. Um, and knowing, you know, staying in touch with that other student, uh, both of them actually to this day. And, you know, the one who was reading to us at two years old is now still, uh, telling stories out in California as a filmmaker. So, oh, wow. uh, it's all, it's all pretty fitting. Yeah, I don't think you had said that back then when we were talking. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it kind of hit me a little bit later to, huh. to kind of draw that connection. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's wild. I mean, two things that jump out. One is, and I say this when I talk to Montessori children who are now adults and they're telling me these stories about when they were three or four and I'm like, oh, <laughs> like I don't, I don't remember anything from when I was three or yeah. four, maybe like one random memory. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that jumps out at me. And then the second thing is, you know, sometimes when I'm giving talks on Montessori, just talking to random parents, I'll say how, oh, the older children help the younger children. And I just, mm -hmm. I like this story because it's easy for me to say that to parents. So they kind of get it. Oh yeah, older kids help younger kids. But it's wild yeah. in Montessori, it's not even about age. It's kind mm -hmm. of who who wants to share something and, and who, like in your case, wants to learn something, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's not really exactly the older and the younger. Uh, it's just, you know, whoever wants to aid and whoever wants to be there and listen. So yeah. Um, I love that Absolutely. story. So how long, I mean, at three years old, that's, I mean, I love the three to six age range, but a lot of parents don't even get in that young. Like when, mm -hmm. when did you start and how long did you go in Montessori exactly? So I started at age three uh, in children's house and I went through the eighth grade. So uh, it was about, I guess, 11 school years there. Oh. Um, so yeah, it started pretty young and then stayed there for a while. So you're, you're the real deal Montessori child then. Yeah, that's I guess so. Just a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I know that a lot of times parents are interested because most, I mean, like the normal Montessori parent will have their child from like three to five and be like, well, it's now it's time for normal school, you know, because they don't really mm -hmm. know, you know, the three year cycle in Montessori You're supposed to stay for that third year. And then, yeah. And then, yeah, a lot of times elementary is a little bit more challenging with Montessori schools and there aren't as many. So it's, you're kind of one of those rare cases that actually did it, went through Montessori elementary. So are there you know, a few standout moments that maybe can kind of shed some light on what happens in Montessori Elementary for some of the parents and even teachers out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and I really saw the elementary school experience as a continuation of 
of what was happening, um, you know, from those young ages. I think, sure. you know, you're definitely right in in saying that, you know, a lot of people think about Montessori and, and they focus on, you know, when you're young and you're in children's house and, you know, maybe through first or second grade, um, but really continuing through with that same mindset of, you know, being hands-on both with the materials, um, but also just with the learning in general. So having sort of that independently guided, uh, you know, path of learning to where, you know, I was able to focus on what was most interesting to me at the time. And, and that was, uh, you know, primarily math, um, you know, math and kind of extending that into science a little bit. Um, and so, you know, I was able to kind of just focus on that area and, and keep exploring. Um, and actually, you know, one of the other things I remember from the children's house is that I, I completed all of the, the math works in the children's house classroom, um, you know, in my second year there. And so then in my third year when I was in kindergarten, um, you know, I was able to go down uh, into the lower elementary class, which was first through third grade, uh, and start to to use some of those works there. Um, Wait, and so then, when you sort say of, you were you were able to go in there, like what did they do? Like open the door for you? How close was it? Like what did that look like? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of right around the corner. Um, so we would uh-huh. have, uh, you know, that teacher would would take some time out of out of their day to help me. Uh, you know, even though I wasn't really in their class at the time, uh-huh. uh, which was great. And so. You know, from there, sort of the same thing happened in, in lower elementary. I went through all of those works. And in that case, we had the upper elementary classroom, which was fourth through sixth grade right next door. Mm-hmm. And so there was a sort of set time during the day um, when, you know, the students were off in, in maybe an art class or something. And so the, the teacher in that classroom had, uh, you know, kind of some free time and, you know, was willing to, to sit down with me one on one and kind of wow. keep bringing me through the curriculum. Um, so it was really great you know, not only just in terms of being able to, to follow what I was interested in, but just having that general sort of sense of community for the whole school to where teachers who weren't even my teacher at the time, um, you know, were taking time out of their day to help me, um, which yeah. I didn't really appreciate fully at the time. But now looking back, um, you know, I think it's pretty great. Yeah. And what, you know, it's interesting because I hear you because you talked about, you know, you've got math, which is like normally thought of as this hardcore kind of academic subject. But then you've mm-hmm. also you're also talking about this sense of community because you use the word community there and I yep. think for me and just hearing your story like I've seen this often and it, there's this feeling that first of all that it's it's almost like a family like the, the fact that you can mm-hmm. walk over to some other teacher and she's like oh hey hey buddy let's let's do some yeah. of this it's like it's such a pleasant just a comfortable place to be and I don't know did you have that same it's kind of just the sense of life if you get this feeling like wow I feel good here like did you have mm-hmm. that as this you know as you were developing Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, a part of it that helps uh, is my mom actually worked at the school. Um, okay. And so she was a teacher there. And so naturally, you know, she knew the other teachers. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, the school is pretty small. So, um, you know, you maybe have, you know, 20 kids in your classroom and just a handful of classrooms of that age, um, you know, around the school. So everyone kind of knows, um, you know, who everyone is. And so mm-hmm. teachers in other classrooms would get to know you, even though, you know, they're not working with you frequently. And so you do kind of generally have that, you know, altogether sense of community that, you know, comes with having a, a smaller school there. Um, and that was yeah. definitely something that benefited me um, because, you know, in those situations where maybe, um, you know, what I wanted to do didn't fall within the realm of what my actual teachers, uh, you know, w- were doing at the time, there yeah. were other teachers around, um, you know, who were you know, more than happy to step in um, and kind of help me continue along those paths. You know, I remember it's, it's the, even you saying that I remember as myself as a teacher, it was like, if you're teaching all these subjects, you're supposed to know everything. And, you mm-hmm. know, this is more in the traditional school um, because you're the one with the quote knowledge as opposed yeah. to kind of aiding the child to, to learn. Um, mm-hmm. So I like that you're raising this, that it's like, there's, there's so much opportunity in these quote communities that you've got um, to kind of learn from other teachers. And I imagine as you got older, cause I'm curious about like in elementary, they, usually there's these going outs or going to see, mm-hmm. you know, to learn from other people outside, even the school. Like, did you have that or is that not a part of your Montessori school? Or? Um, yeah, we definitely did. Um, you know, we would go out in, into the community and, and do different things, um, you know, whether it be going to the symphony um, or going to some type of performance or, um, you know, actually the the biggest sort of going out that I think would extend beyond, um, you know, what happens at a lot of schools is we had sort of this culminating, um, you know, sixth grade experience, which was a trip to New York City. So and all of grade. the, 
in sixth grade. So okay. all of uh, kind Wait, of elementary. I should say, where were you again? Because I'm mean, like, I'm, I'm, oh, in yeah. Cal- I'm normally in California. It's like this big mm-hmm. trip to New York City. Like, where were you? Yeah, well, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. So. Okay, so not too far, but still, the city's pretty yeah. intense for a sixth still grade. Still a, a pretty big, uh, pretty big difference there. Okay. Um, but sort of, you know, the the other cool thing about it, rather than actually just the opportunity to go to New York City at that age, um, which is great in, in and of itself, um, is that the entire trip uh, is planned by the sixth graders, um, you know, except for a couple of things that are, are consistent every year. Uh, there's sort of one dinner that everyone does together and, mm-hmm. and one Broadway show that everyone goes to together that the teachers coordinate. Everything else is is driven by the students. So is this, each, I mean, is this is this some kind of like, oh, yeah, the students get to pick their things and it's really not <laughs> the case or like what? What is it like? No, it, it pretty much is the case. Um, every yeah. student is tasked with choosing sort of a research subject. And okay. so the whole year in sixth grade, you're going through, you're learning all about New York City. Um, and then each individual student is focused on something specific. So I was focused on the stadiums and parks in the city, um, you know, having interest in in sports. Um, you know, that was what I was focused on. So I was researching, you know, Madison Square Garden, Yankee Stadium, um, and just sort of the whole public park system, um, you know, all of the public, uh, you know, baseball fields and everything, um, you know, throughout the city. And so we would do this whole research project. And then the culmination of it is that you would go somewhere from your, uh, you know, somewhere that related to your research project uh, and give sort of a short uh, presentation of, you know, what you had learned. Um, so you'd stand up and give a speech. So in the sixth grade, I was actually calling up Madison Square Garden to book a behind the scenes so tour for like, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 people. And I just cannot imagine being on the other end of that phone call and yeah. hearing my voice calling in in the Love sixth it. grade uh, and, and booking that. But, you know, it, it happened and we went and it was amazing. Um, and then I, you know, gave my speech and we went on to, to the next person's place. So it was a really cool experience to, to be that embedded in it. And it made it so much more meaningful because everywhere that we were going, for the most part, was, you know, somewhere that someone had spent you know, close to the entire school year researching and learning all wow. about, and then they were able to share their learnings with the rest of the class. That's, I mean, that's so exciting. And I just, I think about like kind of nor- the normal traditional way that people deal with this. And it's this phony, like, well, let's give the, the children a little bit of feeling like they're doing something on their own, you know? And it's like, mm-hmm. here here's the money and you can pay for yeah. the meal, you know, or something like mm-hmm. you guys are like planning the actual trip. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I we even... took it all the way, we took it all the way down to the direction. So we had to oh, figure out how we were getting from one place to the next yeah. place. So we had to do it all, you know, with maps, not with, uh, you know, smartphones now. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, you know, we were mapping out all of our different paths. And then when we were going, you know, two students were leading the group and the yeah. teachers were, were there yeah. to make sure we didn't do anything too bad and go completely the wrong yeah, direction. Yeah. But you know, ultimately it was the students leading the way. Um, and so, you know, the teachers, you know, didn't really need to step in at all. I, I love this. And I'm just thinking about you in sixth grade. Like I, when I was about that age, I was totally into like buying and trading baseball cards and that, that mm-hmm. type of thing. And I just think about the knowledge I had back then of these players and then what these cards mm-hmm. are worth. And, and it's like, you do, you do have such an ability back then, but it's usually thought of as like, Oh, it's just this childish thing that they're doing. But it's like, yeah, it really is. If you apply it to the real world, like why mm-hmm. wouldn't you be able to do all of what you're saying? You know, it makes no, complete absolutely. sense. Well, I should probably jump in and like let let the audience know a little bit about what you do now, like what you're doing in the mm-hmm. real world, because that I mean, that that alone, like, I mean, there's people, there are adult jobs that do that, you know, like yeah. what you just did. But what so I know you work for this company called Knack and it's a tutoring company. But can you give us a mm-hmm. little bit of more sense of what you're doing there, what it's all about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So we are an education technology startup uh, based out of Tampa, Florida. And so what we do is we partner with universities uh, to onboard their high achieving students as peer tutors and mentors uh, for other students on campus. So the other students can kind of book them and meet up for help, um, you know, similar to a, you know, Uber or Airbnb style model. Um, and then, you know, as far as my involvement, I'm actually the head of operations. So I deal a lot with our internal business operations, um, but I also, you know, being a part of a, a pretty small team you know, bleed over into marketing, um, you know, helping with products, doing some research. Uh, we're actually building out, um, you know, sort of a, a skills development program in collaboration with one of our investors, uh, the education testing service who makes the SAT, the GRE and all of that. Um, I just finished working on our, our first tutor training um, to a little bit of account management, 
sales, a little bit of everything. Um, but yeah, it, it's been going, you know, really well so far. Um, you know, I got involved with them while I was still in college, um, and then mm-hmm. moved down here to Tampa just over a year ago when I graduated. So just thinking about this company, I mean, when I think of like tutoring companies, like there's, I mean, like thousands of tutoring companies. So, mm-hmm. and I just, I, you know, in having you on, I know that you had talked about kind of this entrepreneurial mindset when we had spoke a, a few weeks back, mm-hmm. like why do we need another tutoring company? And then how does that kind of integrate with your views around, around being an entrepreneur and, and, and mm-hmm. that type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest misconceptions around entrepreneurialism in general um, is is this kind of association with true invention. Um, you know, I have a, a great brand new idea, um, and then you know immediately that's that's a company, that's a viable business. Uh, so you look at you know Uber, or Lyft, and and you hear people say, oh, I, you know, I wish I would have thought of that. Um, <laughs> when in in reality, I mean, the idea of being able to to call a, a taxi cab from your phone already existed. Um, what they changed was the model of how to implement it. And so what they did was they expanded the supply. They activated all of this, what you call latent supply to bring on all these additional drivers to where now, you know, it's not, you know, they're not limited to the drivers who are committed to being a full-time taxi cab driver. Now anyone, you know, with a car is a driver. Uh, and so it, it really flips the whole model on its head to where, um, you activate all of that additional supply, which then in turn induces additional demand because you have all this increased availability, which, uh, you know, speaking from economic terms, you know, moves that point of equilibrium to where now it's able to to shift that demand curve as well. Um, and so what they created there was a different model for implementing something that already exists. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I feel like that's what we've been able to do, um, you know, with NAC is, you know, it's well documented the many benefits, um, you know, of peer tutoring, uh, of tutoring in general, specifically in a in a near peer format, and uh, the co development that takes place. You know, the, not only the development for the student who's receiving help, but also for the student who's giving help. And what we've been able to do is build a better model for uh, enabling, you know, and maximizing those interactions, you know, on a college campus to where you're not limited to what you have been traditionally. Um, with all of these fixed costs of operating, you know, an in-person set, an in-person mm. tutoring center, um, but you're able to expand it and able to bring on a lot more tutors who maybe some of them can only work a couple hours here or there, but you, you know, mm. overall increase that, that span of coverage so that more students can get help when it's convenient for them, you know, in a, in a manner that is both efficient from a cost perspective, but also mm. effective from an administrative perspective. So, I mean, it's wild because I didn't think about this when we were talking because I didn't get a good exact sense of how this all worked. But it kind of makes me think about like you're in the children's house and all those mm-hmm. kids are around and the two year olds helping you basically tutoring you. But in college, you yeah. kind of need some money. So it's like, mm-hmm. is it basically the same thing like the in that class, but the two year olds making a little bit of money doing what he's doing to help you? That's absolutely 100 oh, cool. percent. Um, yeah, we're really just trying to you know, build and bolster this, this peer learning, you know, in the college space. And Mm -hmm. it's really, you know, in the roots of higher education itself. I mean, why do you, you come to a college together, the idea of, of learning with other students, um, that, that discourse, and that's where the growth really happens to where you can bring in all these different perspectives. And so what we're trying to do is enable more of that and enable Mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, yes, some students get paid. Some students decide to do it for free. They want to volunteer their time to help other students on campus. Um, and, you know, we can enable that as well. So it's really just in, in any way that we can trying to drive more of these peer learning interactions and trying to make them as meaningful as possible. Yeah, that's that sounds awesome. Now, in talking about college, I know a lot of entrepreneurs these days are just like, oh, the hell with college. I'm skipping it. Like, Did you go to college or? <laughs> Yes, I did go to college briefly. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I went to North Carolina State University uh, in Raleigh. Okay. And um, I was there, I was actually able to to graduate in two years. Um, I had a lot of AP oh. credit coming in. Uh, oh, so that, yeah, I thought that briefly yeah. was like, hey, I was there. And I was like, Oh, this is kind of a waste. I'm out of here. <laughs> you actually uh, yeah, graduated I, just two years. I, I did. I did end up graduating. Um, I got involved with NAC when I first got to campus. Uh, oh, my yeah. freshman year, I actually signed up as a tutor. Um, I didn't realize that they were new in the area and, um, they were, they reached out, you know, asked if I wanted to get involved with campus marketing. So I kind of just kept getting more and more involved, giving them all of my ideas, uh, for how to, how to change things, make the, the company better, make the, you know, interactions more effective, um, mm-hmm. you know, how to, how to market better, how to change that program. Um, and so I basically just 
was nonstop, uh, you know, sharing all of my ideas for the company uh, and just kind of, you know, got more and more involved there. Uh, and I reached a point where, um, you know, it, it, it made sense since I was able to, to graduate in that additional year um, to just go ahead and, and make sure I got my degree uh, before coming on full time. So, I mean, just hearing you speak, I know I've got to imagine because I'm even thinking it myself, but parents out there, teachers like, oh, this this kid's kind of like well, this adult now. He's he's kind of it seems like an independent guy, like maybe that's just mm-hmm. a part of his nature. Like, do you think you had this kind of inborn quality or do you think Montessori aided that or what do you think in terms of independence? Yeah, and I mean, it's it's kind of tough to pinpoint exactly. I, you know, I'd have to say it's probably a combination, um, you know, naturally going through Montessori alongside a lot of the same people. Um, and, you know, even having both of my older sisters go through Montessori as well, you see that, um, you know, everybody is a little bit different in terms of how they relate um, and, you know, really react to the whole independent structure. Um, so I think I did have, you know, some sort of predisposition to be a little bit more independent, but, you know, that also comes with it being fostered every single day. Uh, when I go to school, when I come home, um, you know, being able to, to be put in a situation where it's not a default of, I'm going to tell you what to do. It's, you know, you tell me what you want to do. Um, and we'll see if that's you know possible, kind of guide you as needed rather than, um, you know, kind of just expecting, uh, you know, the person from a young age to just take in all this direction, mm-hmm. um, you know, rather than, you know, really empowering them with the opportunity to, to make those decisions for themselves. So I think it's definitely a combination, but without a doubt, you know, being in that, Montessori atmosphere um, definitely helped to foster it. Okay, yeah, and I th- I think that makes sense. And I I mean I don't who knows it's always this nature versus nurture kind of conversation. Mm-hmm. I think that will go on for the you know as far as human beings exist probably. But um, yeah. I, I'm raising it because I know just thinking of Montessori because if you, let's say you come in you're a little bit more independent, you know, mm-hmm. is there direction that you felt that they were kind of like, hey, well you know this guy's kind of a leader but we need to be able to kind of aid him to work mm-hmm. with others, you know, versus another child that might come in and is like, Hey, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. It's kind of more of a yeah. follower. And then they need to kind of guide mm-hmm. him towards independence. Like, do you think there was a sense of that with the teachers or you, you were too young to kind of even see maybe what no, was going I, on? I definitely can, can remember, you know, instances where they would do that from both sides. Um, and so there was sort of an emphasis. And, and like you mentioned earlier, uh, the really interesting thing about the three age classroom is that you know, it isn't always, um, you know, the older students in the classroom being the leaders and the younger students being the followers. Um, you know, there was even simple things like I remember when we were in children's house, uh, you know, walking out to recess, someone would always lead that. They would be in the front of the mm-hmm. line. Um, and that would just cycle through pretty much the whole classroom. And so everybody was kind of thrown into that, you know, leader position and thrown into that follower position. Um, and then more generally, the idea of kind of working through things in the classroom the collaboration piece was always there. And I think that's one of the things that can sometimes get overlooked when talking about, um, you know, the, the greatness of Montessori and building independent learners um, mm-hmm. is that there is also, a, at least in my experience, there was also a great emphasis on collaboration and a great yeah. opportunity to collaborate with other students who are also interested in the same things to where I had, you know, students in my upper elementary class, there'd be a handful of us who were really interested about a certain math concept. And so we would go out, um, you know, the three of us, and we would, you know, continue exploring that. So one of the kind of traditional things, um, you know, when learning the Pythagorean theorem is, you know, why is this important? How is it practical in the real world? And they always in textbooks give you this, um, you know, visual of if you wanted to measure like a flagpole or something, yeah. you know, you'd go a certain distance from the flagpole and you would know your angle to, to see the top of the flagpole. And then you'd be able to figure out how tall it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's funny about that is, you know, I've done a lot of tutoring in my time. Um, and so I would have students with those types of things and they would say, you know, but when are you ever going to do this? Uh, well, we, we did that <laughs> at yeah. Montessori. Uh, we went out, we had this device, uh, like a protractor to figure out, um, you know, what the angle was. We measured the distance and we figured out how tall that flagpole was. Uh, yeah. So it was, you know, very sort of hands on to, to go through it, but it wasn't you know, me out there doing it by myself, it was me and a couple other classmates who were interested to where yeah. we could all play off of one another um, and really, you know, collaborate to make that learning more impactful. Yeah. And I'm happy you, you raised that because when I think of independence and I know it's kind of not the norm, but I think of like to be independent also means to be able to know when to ask for help. Um, Absolutely. So do, and, and so I'm curious because you sound like a confident guy, not in some kind of arrogant way, just, you know, like a genuine confidence. Mm-hmm. 
Do you have any fear of failure? Because I know that's a big thing in you know this entrepreneurial mindset and definitely in just thinking about business today and in life, people are talking about, you've got to be comfortable with failure. Um, mm-hmm. Do you see yourself as having any fear of failure? And then do you do you think of that as like an important thing if you do or if you don't? Like, what's your view yeah. on that? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in this entrepreneurial setup, there's kind of this glorification of failure, right? It's, uh, you know, you have to be comfortable to, to fail and, and continue to fail until you eventually succeed. And I think there's some truth to that. But I think what gets undermined is that um, you know, nobody likes to fail. No one's aiming to fail. What's mm-hmm. important and what I think Montessori helps with is it teaches you how to fail and how to learn from failures because it's looked at in a, in a sense where if you're in a traditional classroom, the way I like to think about it is if you fail, it's presented as you getting a failing grade, which is very final. You took mm-hmm. a test and you did not do well on it. In a Montessori setup, if you fail, it's just an early step in the process towards you eventually succeeding Mm -hmm. because there's not this finality of, oh, you didn't understand this right away. That's the end. Let's move on to something else. It's okay. This didn't work, but this might. Uh, And so it teaches you how to to really kind of continue. um, And it teaches you that oftentimes, you know, failure of some kind is inevitable. You know, things are not going to go according to plan. And so I do think that being in that Um, you know, atmosphere allowed me to, you know, really from a young age, understand what, you know, failure was in the sense of it connecting to a longer objective, um, and, you know, rather than it being the end of the road. So it's this kind of part of the process is, I mean, we think of it as failure is kind of this horrible thing that occurs. But if we think of it as something like, hey, yeah, there's going to be bumps along the way, and you're going to have to deal with them, because that's a part of any success is basically Mm -hmm. It's funny because we, we, I don't know where I, I might've said this somewhere on the podcast before, but we had opened a school somewhere and we took over this old public school. And literally mm-hmm. when we went into the classroom, there was a poster on the wall. And this again, this is old school, public elementary school. It says, nobody yeah. gets paid for failing. Wow. <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, so, you know, you think of it like, oh, public school is so traditional, just tur- churning out these, you know, these, these workers in a factory or something but mm-hmm. it really is the case like philosophically yeah. that, that they are pushing that or at least they were for mm-hmm. so long so anyway so it's cool to hear you talk about that so do you sense now do you have any when you go into some is there a fear of like oh my god this this could be a mess and you're concerned or is it more like yeah i'm kind of aware it's there's going to be some messes along the way but i'm comfortable yeah definitely the latter i mean it, okay. it's never the focus and what i think is important is that you don't make it the focus mm-hmm. as if you focus on I don't want to fail. It changes how you approach the problem. I mean, if you take it back to a learning perspective um, and you think about the mindsets of, you know, the students, if you come from a a performance oriented mindset where all that matters is the grade, all that matters is I don't want to fail. Oftentimes the learning can, you know, be sacrificed in that process because it's, I'm not willing to, you know, raise my hand in class and say something because I don't want the teacher to think that I don't know what I'm talking about. Yep. Um, and I, I want to present this idea of, of, you know, being at some sort of level. And so I want to present the idea that I'm smart. I have to keep getting these grades so that I'm smart. Mm-hmm. And maybe for some students that leans them into, oh, I need to take shortcuts to get there. You know, rather if you come from sort of a, a learning mindset where what you're focused on is actually the learning itself, uh, then it changes how you think about the whole process. And so I think that mm-hmm. extends into, you know, business, you know, really anything wow. where if, if failure is the focus, um, then it changes how you are, you know, addressing the problem. Um, you know, whereas if you think about it of, in, in a sense of, you know, not everything's going to go according to my plan that I have and that's okay. I'm comfortable with, you know, overcoming these setbacks, then I feel like you can get a lot further. Yeah. And I, it's, it's, it's wild to think about how this kind of integrates even in the broader world in just thinking about our culture, there, there tends to be a, a desire, or at least what we see on kind of social media to kind of, here's my position on this. And you throw out loudly your position, but yeah. there's never, there's not a lot of talk about how did you come to that position? Did you mess mm-hmm. up along the way? Did you say something stupid? It's more of like, yeah. this is what I believe and everybody else should too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I think it's fascinating that I think there's some connection to how most of us were educated. And that's why we have mm-hmm. these conflicts because we don't actually talk about, you know what? I don't really yeah. know if that's true. And I, mm-hmm. I, I'm okay <laughs> with that. You know? No, absolutely. And I, I love that you bring up the kind of social media and the general um, kind of culture at this time is to be really firm on these ideas. Um, mm-hmm. And what I think, you know, makes the most sense is to acknowledge that. 
um, you know, if new information is presented to me, then I might change my ideas. So coming from a perspective of, you know, I am not in a final state of, you know, I know this to be 100 percent true, but rather coming from from a state of here's, you know, what went into me developing this opinion. Um, you know, if you have any other information, you're kind of welcoming that in and incorporating yeah. it. A lot of times it's no like committed, stay exactly 100 percent to what you have said in the past. And, you know, if you look at uh, celebrities or public figures and you'll pull things from, you know, 20 years in their past and say, well, you said this then, you know, how can you say this now? And I, I, I look at that as the most absurd thing ever because it's, you know, naturally you should hope that some growth would take place in those yes. 20 years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, not to sort of hide and say, oh, I know I never said that. I never thought that. But to acknowledge, yes, I used to believe this. And then, you know, I learned and I looked into it more. And now I believe this. Yeah. Um, you know, I just feel like that, you know, makes sense. And, and perhaps that is, um, you know, something that has a lot to do with, you know, the education that I went through. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm really happy you have been given such a kind of an example like that, because it's it is kind of sad. It's like the idea that, hey, we grow as human beings. Like, I hope I'm not the same person when I was 18. Like that would yeah. be problematic. Like at some core level, maybe you really, you know, you think, oh, I was a good individual, whatever. But man, mm -hmm. hopefully you've you've developed and learned and made some errors along the way. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and it's a fascinating thing because if let's say you were you know nineteen twenty did something horrific, it's like yeah, there's there's an extent to which it's like well, that's, yeah. not, that's not good. I don't care how much you've changed. Like that's horrible. Absolutely. But but I think mm -hmm. yeah, the stuff the, most of the stuff that that kind of comes up is the case. It's like to give, give somebody a break if they developed. Um, mm -hmm. But it is, it is also fascinating that a lot of people, it's either there's an immediate need to kind of apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. Or there's the opposite of like, Oh, what does that matter? So yeah. again, I think, and I, I, I think it's the opposite in Montessori environments, whatever age, it's this mm -hmm. openness to be like, Hey, share it. And, you know, we're comfortable yeah. with messing up. So I just wish this would kind of translate into the culture. Like even thinking of you as I think of you, you're a businessman, right? Like this is mm -hmm. you're an entrepreneur. But most even business people are all thrown together as if they're kind of these bad individuals and so forth. And, and it's yeah. like everybody kind of uniquely different. And there might be a good business person and a kind of a mm -hmm. pretty shallow or bad one, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. So and I wonder, you know, just thinking about Montessori and I know I'd asked you about yourself kind of how much of this was kind of inborn with you mm -hmm. stepping away from the classroom i know you think you said your mom was a montessori teacher yeah do you have do you think of your parents as having a significant impact do you think this was all montessori in my nature you know what do you think about your parents involvement in kind of helping to develop the person you are today yeah you know 100 percent. i think you know, one of the the general things kind of going back off this this point of, you know, not being particularly nuanced in these opinions that are put forward and, you know, standing really firm on it's this or it's that, um, you know, I think it, it makes sense in any situation to, to think about all of the factors that went into it. So naturally, um, you know, the Montessori played a big role in it, but then coming home and, you know, my mom being a Montessori teacher, carrying those principles back into the home, um, and you know, really extending that into other areas of life to where, you know, I was able to kind of make more, you know, independent type decisions at younger ages, um, you know, than a lot of other people might've had the opportunity to do, um, you know, where I was deciding to go to high school, for instance, um, you know, I got into a, you know, pretty prestigious charter school in the area and the typical perception, um, you know, of everyone is if you get in, you have to go, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and, you know, we went, we visited it and it didn't feel like a good fit for me. And so at that age mm. of, you know, maybe 13, um, you know, I was able to, to communicate that back to my parents and they were, um, you know, able to get on board with that decision that I was making. Um, mm. And so I think that, you know, carrying it through, um, you know, into the home and, and naturally everything else and all the support that I have gotten, you know, from both of my parents um, has been extremely important. But I think, you know, carrying through those same types of principles to where, from a young age, you're not treated as a kid, you know, you're mm -hmm. treated as an, an individual, um, you know, who does have their own ideas. And that's not to say, oh, you know, you're running the show from a, from a young age, because that's yeah. definitely not the case. But it's just a different mindset of how do you engage with, um, you know, that that child's ideas, um, you know, and really make sure that they feel like their ideas are valuable, um, you know, valuable enough to keep providing those ideas and sharing them um, and growing from that. So I think, you know, definitely what both of my parents, um, you know, did for me was ex extremely 
uh, you know, important um, because, you know, one thing's not going to solve all problems, you know, going through Montessori program by yeah. itself, um, you know, is not going to be a cure all for everything. Um, and so, you know, I think it is important to acknowledge all those different influences. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like there was a similar respect in your home for just the sense mm-hmm. that, as you were saying, you're an individual, but this, this, hey, let's see what you have to say, but not like, you know, oh, I just, I want to skip high school or something. And it didn't yeah. make sense. <laughs> they wouldn't have been like, okay, whatever. Well, you know, that sounds yeah. good, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's often how it's presented. I think, unfortunately, and it's either, you know, you've got this parent who just lets their child run amok and go crazy. It's, oh, whatever you want. It's your opinion. I respect your opinion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, or it's this, you know, old school, hardcore, I'm the dad, I'm the mom, you you do what yeah. I say. Um, mm-hmm. So, but it, I mean, I understand because it is, as you, I think you said something about being nuanced with one of the elements before, but yeah. it isn't easy um, mm-hmm. to figure out how to, how to deal with kids. So is there anything else? I know we're getting close to, uh, you know, I think we're trying to get under 45 minutes on this one, but is there anything else maybe you want to share with people out there or about your experience or anything really? Um, I guess, you know, I made a little bit of a reference to it earlier, um, you know, with the idea that the Montessori method is, is helping really to, to build, you know, individuals with this independent mindset. But I think it, it extends beyond that, you know, taking in the collaboration um, and really grouping all of these things into uh, sort of the general skill set, you know, needed for success, you know, in life, in the economy. Um, and, you know, here at NAC, we're actually, um, you know, working, as I alluded to earlier, uh, with ETS, the creators of the GRE and the SAT, um, to really explore and build off of, um, you know, how you can both measure and encourage the development of what's considered these 21st century career uh, competencies, which are a collection of soft skills, um, you know, identified by the uh, National Association of Colleges and Employers uh, for what's important, um, you know, in, in work today, you know, things like collaboration, teamwork, critical thinking, uh, communication, really extending into all these areas to look at, you know, fundamentally, what do you need? What skill sets do you need, um, you know, in order to be successful? And I, what I think is amazing about Montessori is that it it really instills all of those things from a young age uh, to mm-hmm. where you you know have that leadership, but you have the collaboration as well. Very focused on you know interpersonal communication, learning how to converse you know with adults from a young age. I mean, just the fact that our teachers um, you know would go by their first names. You know, we would address yeah. them as another individual. You know, rather mm-hmm. than you know someone who's in this removed um, you know kind of leadership position, but someone who is a leader but is also, you know, working with you, um, you know, rather than sort of just directing you and telling you what to do. Um, so I think all of that helps you really build these skill sets um, to where, you know, when I transitioned into a traditional schooling atmosphere, um, you know, or when I, I started working, you know, all of those skill sets are, you know, what will carry through through the rest of your life to be important. And I think it's great how Montessori develops all of them from a young age. And you know, it sounds like this, you know, this idea of like reverse engineering something. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, just understanding Montessori philosophy and where she came from, I think there is clearly an element that she's looking at. Hey, what would, what does a human being need to live? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, and live, live well and live, you know, enjoyably. And then you kind of reverse engineer and say, okay, what would they need to learn as young children? Mm-hmm. Um, so it sounds like in, even in the work that you're doing, it's kind of like, well, what would we need as employers today that are going to be very helpful? And yeah. we go back down. And so in a sense, what you're saying is a lot of what you had in Montessori was exactly what was needed to, to kind of have successful employer employees later in life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that helped my transition into, you know, I went to a public school for high school um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, then into college from there. And you go from, you know, not having any grades uh, to having grades. And luckily for me, the the middle school at my Montessori school did help with that transition to where we did start having grades. They weren't, you know, the only focus, but it kind of, you know, got you accustomed to a traditional schooling, um, you know, setup. But to where when I transitioned, a lot of people would look at me and say, oh, you know, Will's just really smart. That's why he does well in school. Um, and I feel like it, it it made sense at the time for them to think about it in that way. But for me, it was, you know, I had this really strong foundation to where, you know, I learned how to learn. Um, and if you learn how to learn, you can learn anything, uh, yeah. you know, rather than having some base of knowledge or everything that I knew already. Um, you know, I was really just well equipped with the tool set um, that was needed 
you know, in order to do well in a classroom setting, um, yeah. you know, even though it was developed outside of a classroom setting. So, you know, that's where I, I think if you do look at it from a reverse engineering or from sort of a, a first principles method of thinking, you know, what are those fundamental things that individuals need to be successful? And then how can you instill them? Uh, you know, I really think that, you know, all of these these years later, Maria Montessori did an excellent job at, at pinpointing yeah. what those are. Yeah. And I mean, just hearing you talk about this, it sounds like she talks a lot about a- adaptation, your ability as a human being to adapt to new situations. Um, mm-hmm. And just you're coming into a public school and then the kids being like, oh, well, this, you know, he's, he's just really smart. And I, I like that you're pointing out that, yeah, in their context, that's what it would seem like. Because in mm-hmm. public school, you know, if somebody was just doing so well, it's like, oh, yeah, he's just really good at math. Yeah. Um, where what you're saying is you developed some pretty hardcore, awesome foundational skills that aided you to be able to be like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm stoked you came on. I mean, this is I, I love the integration with kind of what you're doing now and how you view the world and kind of how you're living with what you did as a younger age. I have to imagine there's a lot of parents out there being like, oh, man, I wish I would have had some, something like this when I was a kid. <laughs> But yeah, so thank you very much for coming on, Will. Yeah, Jesse, I appreciate it. I uh, really enjoyed this this conversation. I, I really appreciate everything that you're doing uh, to you know spread the the word about Montessori and, and you know let even more people know about it because uh, I definitely do think that it it can be you know extremely valuable um, you know in a young student's life uh, you know throughout the rest of their life. So you know I appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate you having me on.